means I got to do okay. that. It, the got it. Okay. All right. Got Any it. word on Lila? Lila Halpman? Uh, I don't know who that is. Well, I, yeah, I uh -oh. know. But what about her? Uh -huh. No, I was wondering if we have any word on her. What happened to her? Well, we are not sure. That's what I'm meaning. Ah. Is she sick? Whether or it's something? a blood clot or oh, whether it's a collapsed lung. Really? Something like that. Oh, who would know that? I just but try to reach her. Know, you know who would know is Reva Meyerowitz. Oh, I hadn't thought of her. Thank you. Friends. Yeah, I saw Reva yeah. at the sisterhood meeting. And oh, that's right. okay. Lila wasn't there. Right. And she was at the one before. Yeah. So she Hi, Reva. Hi, Reva Wood. How are you? Hi, everybody. Hi, Reva. Spells are different than you. Reva. Hi, Steve. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, Reva, after this, uh, the class, I think you and Dana and I need to go over the parshas or the, the readings for next couple months. Okay. Do you have a copy of that? I have the last, the one from up to February 22nd. Oh, there's hey. a further one. I'll send that to you right away. Okay. Well, we have it through May. Oh, good. Okay. Then oh, good. Discuss it. Any well, then time. send it out to all of us. Please. They want to go over. Uh, it, uh, Charlotte has the okay to go ahead and send it to everybody. Okay. She just received it. Thank you. Evelyn. Yeah. How are you? Hi. Okay. I have a question for you. Bert yes. said to ask, Bert said to ask you. Years ago, you dropped out of the choir in the temple because of your voice. Yeah. What did you do? To, I'm having. My voice just doesn't have its strength anymore, or it's oomph. Mm. What did you do, I should ask you. Actually, you it was more than the voice. I was de developing hearing problems, and I was not able to hear the notes properly, so that I couldn't tell whether or not I was hearing whether Baruch was flat or sharp or on key. And the result was that I couldn't hear whether I was singing on flat or sharp or on key. And um, I felt that I would be no longer an asset <laughs> to the choir. You'll always be an asset. But, you know, but, but your voice seems good now. It's fine. I is, Other than we have no choir at the moment, so it doesn't make a bit of difference. Right. <laughs> That's true. And, yeah, the, and yeah. the hearing aids have made a tremendous difference, too. They've improved the hearing aids to the point oh, yes. where I can hear just about everything reasonably well. However, I still can't hear the very high notes. So when I listen to an orchestra, I cannot hear the violins particularly well. Uh, the oh. cellos come in fine. The woodwinds, you know, and the brasses are fine. But if I'm listening to Beethoven and I can't hear the the violins, it's only half a symphony, not the whole symphony, as a right. yeah. <laughs> so the, oh. the hearing problem is still there. It's not complete. Okay. Well. So who did you get your hearing aids from? Uh, I go to Clear Audiology on Del Webb Boulevard. You know where the Perkins Delaney Eye Clinic is on yes. Del Webb? Well, they're right next door. It's called Clear Audiology. I've been going to them for about 18 years. Okay. And what? how do you spell the first name? Clear. Do you want their telephone number? Oh, you have it? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Hold this on. This is called One Stop Shopping. shopping. Yes, okay. Uh, I go to Costco. Good morning. <laughs> okay. <coughs> yes. telephone, their telephone number, have you got it? Yeah. 623-825-0999. Okay. And it's called uh, CLEAR, C-L-E-A-R, audiology. Okay, CLEAR. Audiology. audiology. Yeah, because I need to you're have talking, some, a good place. About here? I went to Costco. It didn't work for me. No. Uh, I kept them for six months. They let you keep them for six months. It didn't. It won't take them back. Yeah, yeah, they'll take them back and they'll give you back your money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, well then yeah. I got but, spoiled because Russ gave me Larry Mattel's after Larry died. They were brand new. He had just bought them. And so like you, I have the one that wor the it works with my phone. So <laughs> I can up, you know, adjust the level of sound or a restaurant or this or that. And uh, so like you, they charge a certain amount per year. And then you have any problem, you can go in and have it taken care of. And you have checkups so many times over the year. And where is this? Um, mine is called, uh, what is it called? I don't even know. Uh, I go out where, on Bola Drive. I have to look it up. Um, okay, okay, I'll get it from you later. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll call you again. again. Let okay. us begin. Are you ready? Disappeared. So uh, we're going to talk about sanctions. Well, after he shows up, we're going to go back on again, right? We're going to go on to class and get my prayer out. So let us uh, begin with the blessing. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, Good morning. Good morning. Whoops. What did I do here? Okay. View. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear and see me okay? Can you, you can see and hear me okay. No delay, yes. no problems. Good. No. Um, today we're talking about the sanctuary. Uh, which is in the um, um, first in the tabernacle, which was portable, and then in the temple. And this is a huge topic. There's been many books written on it. And uh, <clears throat> there are people in Israel today who would like to rebuild uh, the sanctuary in the temple. Um, the problem is that meanwhile, mu Muslims have built two mosques up there on the temple, what's called the Temple Mount, which is where the temple was. Um, and so that creates a certain political problem, which seems to be insurmountable. Um, if they did rebuild a temple, and the primary purpose would be for animal sacrifice, which we, many of us probably would not be too enthusiastic about either anyway. So that's just a brief overview of our subject. And uh, I don't think we've really ever talked about this in any depth. And uh, so uh, this would be a new topic for us. Uh, so um, uh, we're on page 63, Paragal of the Sanctuary in Jewish Tradition and comments, questions, opening statements, yes. Evelyn. Um, I have a question about the diagram that has been shown there. Um, it, it says uh, one of the items is table of shoe bread. I've never heard of that. What is that? Um, well, I don't know exactly. Uh, we would have to, you know, research each of these things. But but there was a table where there was a ritual bread put, I presume. Um, but all the what what happened in there. Uh, the golden candlesticks, the Holy of Holies, the curtain, and of course the Ark of the Covenant, which is famous from Raiders of the Lost Ark, I think. Um, <laughs> all of this is quite mysterious to me. You know, I never studied in depth exactly the structure of the sanctuary in the, in the temple, the tabernacle. So basically your question I have to answer, I don't know. I do. Oh, I, I do. I think Mindy okay. okay. has it. Minya. Over to Steve and then Minya. No, Minya has the answer first. Okay. Go ahead. I did look it up. <clears throat> it's really matzah. It's not a oh. bread as we know bread. Twelve loaves of bread, one to represent each of the tribes, was present in the sanctuary. There was two stacks of six each, and the bread stayed there like all week until Friday. On Friday, when it was replaced by new bread, 
the old bread was given to the Kohen. There you go, Rabbi. You would get all that bread. Oh, wow. <laughs> he would be allowed, he'd be the only one allowed to eat it. Each loaf of bread weighed about 11 pounds. So it was really, really big. Uh, Maimonides said that the bread symbolized the material abundance that God gives the Jews. It is a reminder that our livelihoods and foods come from God. Now, there was a picture on Google, which I can't show you because I don't have it, of the different ways that the table was set up and the shapes of the holders of the bread. Some. Oh, oh we lost You're her. Muted. Oh, there she is. You muted yourself. Thank you. you. Some of them were like a V, some of them were U-shaped, but they were all different shapes um, to actually hold the loaves. And the reason they turned into matzah basically was if it was bread, it was susceptible to mold or <clears throat> any other things that bread turns into when it's not you know, taken care of correctly. So that's what shoe bread is. And in some books, it's actually show, S-H-O-W, bread. Right. Oh, we have a oh. picture from Steve. Can uh -huh. you see that? Yeah. yeah. Looks like a hamburger. Well, yeah, it does. <laughs> but it, 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 yeah, it, but it also represents the 12 tribes. Oh, uh, yeah. Also looks kind of like pita. Yeah, it does. I don't know how it would taste. Like matzo. Worse. Oh, it has no lipid, there's no lipid in it. I'd say worse. <laughs> okay, the end for me anyway. Thanks. And where did you find this information, Minya? Um, on the Chabad website that I got through uh, Wikipedia. Interesting. Mm. Um, other comments about this particular thing about sh shoe bread? Uh, so, so it sat there all week. It wasn't used as part of any ritual. It was no. just there to, to be displayed. And at the end of the week, the Kohen got to take it home and eat it. Right. It was, a sim it was a symbolism. Bread. It was more the symbolism than the actual eating. And which Kohen got to take it home, if I can, can ask a little bit more detail? <laughs> The only um, information they gave me was that the Kohanes took the bread at the end of the week. Okay. So, you have something to look forward to next time. Yeah. Well, um, but you can see that there's a lot of politics around who gets, which Kohanes get to do the rituals. Presumably, um, the Kohen that did a certain ritual would then get the bread. Um, um, but who would get, you know, the rotations? It's like waitresses and... Uh, restaurant, you know, who gets the good shifts where there's more tips, you know, that would be, um, you know, determined, I guess, by the chief priest, by the Cohen Godal. Uh, other questions or comments or opening statements? Pam. Question. Pam. Um, I noticed here that diagram, they talk about incense, and I didn't realize that Jews ever used mm -hmm. incense. Ah. Um, comments? I mean, um, in the synagogue, we didn't afterwards, but in the temple, we did. There was also a lot of uh, stringed instruments in the temple and in the synagogue also, no. So, um, but does anybody have anything to say about incense in the temple? Possibly to disguise the odor from sacrificed animals. Oh my, that's going to be hard to 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 disguise as a when you kill an animal, that would be quite, you know, quite pungent. Or maybe that they didn't bathe too often. Yeah, that's well, in the ancient world, it's a, that's a good question. What was daily life like? You know, how much access did they have to bathing? Um, they had a they had a mikveh that the women were obliged to use. Kind of weekly, but not though, every right? day. Weekly, maybe. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, mikvah of course is for purification, but you could also easily imagine that a secondary purpose was just to keep people a little bit clean. You know, that people that didn't have access to or didn't, or for whatever reason, didn't shower or go in the bath, 
you know, they'd have to at least get wet as part of the mikvah. Ma did Marcia? They, did they um, bathe previous to Shabbat services? Well, um, uh, th there is a tradition among some Hasidic men to go to the mikvah every Friday afternoon before Shabbat. I don't know if that was done uh, in the second temple times. So, so we actually have to differentiate three historical periods at least. There was the tabernacle in the desert, okay? Then there is the first temple that was built by which um, king? Solomon. Solomon, thank you. Solomon. And, and, and then there is, and then that was destroyed by the Babylonians in about 586 BCE. And then it was rebuilt under Ezra about a hundred and something years later. Uh, um, let's say fifth or sixth century BCE. So, and then it was renovated by Herod. So you have the tabernacle, the first temple, and then the second temple. Second temple has the original, which was very simple, and then the renovated version, which was much more grandiose. Then it was destroyed by the Romans. Most Jews expected that it would be rebuilt because the first temple was rebuilt, um, but the politics were such that the Romans never let the Jews rebuild it. So um, that was it. And now, th then, as Pam points out, synagogues, which had previously existed a little bit, became much more prominent, but many features were carried over in some symbolic form, but some were not. Incense, animal sacrifices, shoe bread was not really carried over. M many things were not. And the, the, whole, the whole atmosphere, as you can see, is completely different. Okay, other comments, Bernie. Is it possible that the, the spice box for Abdallah is a, is a modern day version of incense? Um, well, um, I don't know. Good thought. <laughs> You're asking, yeah. Yeah. I, I, this is the second Good time thought, in like, the second time in less than 12 minutes that I had to say, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's possible. I, I There would have to be some source directly tying it in, but obviously it's both smelling. It's both has to do with uh, the, the smelling uh, sense. Um, um, you know, the, the Havdalah is directly tied into the end of Shabbat. The incense here was tied into sacrificial schedule. Um, so I don't necessarily, I don't know. So, hey, Rabbi, I think, yes. we, should have a, I think uh, we should have a class called Stump the Rabbi. <laughs> that doesn't sound <laughs> like much fun at all. <laughs> oh, it'd be kind of fun for us. Yeah, it'd be very fun for one side. <laughs> oh. uh, <laughs> look at it. Everybody's laughing. All right. Well, well, we'd have a lot more people doing Torah study. <laughs> we're laughing with you, Rabbi. We're not laughing at you. <laughs> um, well, then, before I before I get any more questions, I can't answer. Why don't we start reading on page sixty-three? <laughs> I and have you a question. Would be, okay, yes. Yes, I will. But I have a question. Um, Sai's not here, but you know how he always questions what is a story and where did it come from and who wrote it. Well, right. on the very first page, on page 63, on the paragraph that starts, some scholars, I think this backs up size belief in who wrote it, but it because yeah. here it tells you that the description of the Midrash did not belong to the original Torah, but was added to the story of the Exodus by later priests who wanted to justify the existence of the temple and priesthood. Oh, so so now you're moving from stumping me to getting me in further trouble with the rabbinical association. I didn't so, know I doing that. <laughs> so thank you, Minya. Sure. I'm not sure which is worse. <laughs> but that but, was Harry, yeah. Harvey Fields, really, not you. Okay. No, yes, it's Harvey Fields' fault here. Um, but yes, of course. So the 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 
critical, um, critical biblical studies, which is most, um, the, the person who's the most famous in it is a guy named Julius Wellhausen, just after 1900. So he was active in the 1800s. And he is the, the one to whom this whole theory is put because he wrote the most famous book. And in that book, he argued that their Torah is, fa is actually four, at least four sources that were written by different groups. And one of those is the P for priestly. So the priests are myself, my group. And so I have a certain loyalty to them and, and an economic interest. And the priests are concerned with the temple. And so most of the book of Leviticus, as you know, is about the temple. So most of Leviticus is the peace source. Now we're in the book of Exodus, but this stuff is also connected to the temple. So it appears that they wrote it uh, and they put it into, and then when the Torah was redacted, they pushed to have their material included and as did the other groups. And so why do they want their material included because it puts uh, the role of the tabernacle and then the and then the sanctuary as very important and so it increases their the role of the koanim in in judaism so 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 that's the story now an orthodox rabbi would say this is heresy and the torah is from all from god as one document every word and every letter and to say something like this is really completely, uh, you know, sacrilegious, very Blasphemous. sacrilegious. <laughs> and we're being recorded here. <laughs> so, so, um, you know, so this is bad. Um, but I think, um, you know, it's accepted by almost all the scholars in one, in one form or another. So, so yes. Um, uh, now, what does he mean that it was added later? Everything was added later. So, but this was added by the uh, by the priests. And, and I guess what he means is that the that this particular part of the book of Exodus was written later than some of the other parts of the book of Exodus. So, for example, there's parts about the um, Exodus and so on that are very, very old. And they're saying that this is probably... This part is probably no more than I'm just guessing 2,500 years and the other might be 2,900 years or something like that. So it, this may have been written three or 400 years after the other parts, but then there was a process of redaction. We don't know who were the redactors really, but they took these different documents and put it together. So if he's saying that Ever, that the redaction process started without this section and the Torah was put together without this and then somebody stuck it in later, you know, that that's, I guess, what he's implying. I, I wasn't aware of that that, that was the process. I, I thought these parts were all just floating around separately and then at a later date they were put together. But really, we, I'm not sure we know exactly how the redacting happened. But in synagogue, I don't really explicitly refer to this because I don't want to upset people who may not believe in this whole idea of modern critical scholarship. Does that answer your question a little bit? Marsha. I have a question on the practical side. There wasn't any, you couldn't call up or fax somebody and say, I'm doing this to the paperwork, you know, and check. How did they have a meeting yearly or... I mean, how did these rabbis talk to one or, or scholars talk to one another? How did these how did this redaction process took place? Well, yeah, we don't as, know. as a, I mean, how did the is it one group somewhere and then they somehow spread we it don't, out? We don't. We, I don't think we know. I mean, there's no <laughs> documentation about it. But when you look at the Torah, scholars over the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, with Wellhausen being the most famous, he looked at these and looked at the Torah that we have. And he saw, hey, up to chapter 12, it's one style. God is referred to a certain way. 
the, the grammars a certain way, certain vocabulary is used. Then starting in chapter 13, God has got a different name. The language is different. The subject is different. And, and so he and many others said, these two are, they don't match. They must have been written by different groups and then put together. So it wasn't like we had somebody, you know, left a, a letter saying, well, we're a group and we put it together and it was hard and we had big fights over what should be included. And finally we decided and we had meetings on these dates and, you know, like minutes. We don't have anything like that. They're working backwards from the text and they just can see from the text that it's not one unified text, that there's different sections. And so scholars have poured over this and they can, and here you can see very clearly because suddenly the topic turns heavily to things related to the temple, to the sanctuary, all of which would involve the priests. And who else would be interested in this other than the priests? So the priests, you know, the assumption was that a group of priests wrote this. And there's other evidence, you know, there's other secondary evidence from different manuscripts, from things found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, from what Josephus says, you know, that you can kind of piece it together. But there's no way that the book of Exodus, just to focus on that, was all written by one person. It just wouldn't, I mean, unless the person deliberately you changed his language or her language at different points and subject matters in order to give the impression that it was written by different authors. But it's just so different and it's so easy to, to figure out where, where one section and one section does. Now, I have a book by Richard L. E. Friedman, which um, I have an ebook if anybody wants it, um, which has, uh, takes the Torah and uses color coding to see which you know which parts are written by which editors but he doesn't have four he, he has he has like nine or 11 or 13 different different editors or redactors or sections so he has all these different colors so for example in genesis for the first couple of chapters you're going he puts it all in blue meaning that you know that and then he tells you who blue is and then suddenly in chapter two, verse three, he switches it from blue to red and then so on. So you could see in color where the different documents start and end. Now, without a really good knowledge of the Hebrew grammar of the Bible and the vocabulary, it may not be that easy to see the differences, but I think, you know, we could read through it and with Friedman's help, we could figure out, you know, it's not that difficult. You know, the, the God is referred to by a different name, for example, that's pretty obvious. Or this, this text is mostly interested in X. And then we switch and you see that the text is suddenly has a completely different viewpoint. So things like that. So Friedman makes it easy to, to see where the texts are, are. And again, Friedman is the professor in University of Georgia. If he was an Orthodox rabbi, he would be in big, 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 big trouble, especially if it is in Israel today. Is there, was there ever a theory that God wrote the Torah through Moses? Yes, that is the traditional belief, and, and that is the traditional belief that these scholars are deviating from, and therefore that's why they're heretics. So the belief in the Talmud, the belief of the sages, is that God dictated the Torah to Moses. Yeah. It may not say that exactly in the book of Exodus, but that's what the rabbis in the Talmud say clearly and repeatedly. <clears throat> And so um, any other belief is very much problematic, which is why we're going to destroy this tape afterwards. Um, so, so yes, and that poses a challenge to reform Judaism. How do we go with scholarship, but yet maintain some sense of, of a belief system? And how do we, um, you know, how, how do we maintain uh, 
serious religious beliefs uh, when when scholarship makes it very hard to 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 continue to hold to the traditional ones. And if we have no serious beliefs, then anything goes and and, and any, you know, and then then the synagogue is just a social group filled with people who have friends and there's no particular, there's no religion there really. And so that that's that's the big challenge and that's a very, very serious uh, challenge. But yeah, we don't want to go back to the traditional beliefs that we feel are undermined by scholarship. So it that's our central conundrum in, in, in two sentences. Donna, back to you. Did you want to follow that up? Uh, that's what I have been taught. And uh, I do believe that the, the whole Tanakh is, is the word of God. Um, over the, the centuries and the tra many translations and all, many people say, well, it can't be because there was different translations and different meanings and stuff. But I, I, I feel that God gets his word that he wants to his people through the Tanakh. And, uh, but I'm, I'm not, you know, adverse to saying, yeah, I could understand there could be some problems that people would have. You mean Tanakh or you mean Torah? I mean both. Uh, oh, I know okay. we're talking about the Torah, but the whole of the Tanakh, yes. So this is uh, extending that whole belief. Um, it's not clear to me if the if the sages necessarily believe that every word of the prophets and writings was necessarily from God, but clearly they believe that the five books of Moses were. So there might be uh, there was a much greater concern with the sanctity of the five books of Moses. But this is not stated exactly in the Torah itself, in the book of Exodus. It talks about God giving Moses the Ten Commandments. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, of inconsistencies that scholars have tried okay. to explain in a, in a rational way. Uh, but but there's, no, there's no way to really explain it in a scholarly way and maintain the traditional beliefs. So this creates a, a, a sense of, of conflict and angst um, that, you know, there's no easy resolution to. Other comments, B, Bernie, Pam, Steve, yeah. Evelyn, <laughs> Lorraine, <laughs> Shirley, Reva, Minya, Marsha. Can, can okay. I just say? I, can yes. I just say I might as well. <laughs> I mean, I can I can't I can't like Donna take it, you know, the word as written by God, but every so often I think all of us go back in some way in our minds and say, do go back to that belief. We we kind of hover between what we know is more probable scholastically, uh you know, reading, you know, what the probabilities are of how it was written by man, etc. But somehow in the back of our minds, we somehow still cling to that little bit of that this was, you know, God's word. You know, it's it's a tightrope. <laughs> <laughs> Steve. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so uh, these, the words of, of the Torah were actually inspired by God through numerous individuals that's the way i i can describe it that's a good way yeah okay and that allows that's the beginning of a compromise theory that would allow for both uh, uh um a um a view that is somewhat consistent with the sages but also open enough to allow for scholarship yeah and that 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 would be how you would begin to, to compromise in that way and try to fit both sets of beliefs in. Um, also, if you're a postmodernist, uh, postmodernism allows you to believe two or more contradictory things at the same time. So okay. I can believe that the whole Torah is given by God, and I can believe that there were different groups that were redacting it and writing it and editing it. And the two don't have to be uh, consistent so I'm allowed to be completely inconsistent 
Evelyn. Uh, I was thinking about uh, the sanctuary and the priesthood. And after the temple was destroyed um, and you had a diaspora where the people, the, all of the Jews were scattered over the known world as such. And did they worship in a synagogue or did they worship among themselves in small groups? I think of many of the um, groups in Russia, let's say in the 1800s, where the, you had enclaves of Jews. They may not have been permitted to have a, an actual synagogue, an actual building in which to worship. They were so persecuted, but perhaps they met in their own individual or in individual homes where a group of Jews would get together and worship together. Would that be considered a sanctuary? Um, or does the sanctuary have to be a specific building designated for the worship of God and attended by the Jews in the area. When we're talking about the word sanctuary here, we mean the sanctuary in the temple only. Now, there had been other Jewish temples, but at some point in the past, the, 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 I guess the priests began to prohibit them. And they said all other Jewish temples have to be stopped and only the temple in Jerusalem can be done. This was one of the reasons that the Jews and the Samaritans got a divorce. The Samaritans basically practiced Judaism, but they lived in the north. And it was rumored that they had interbred with the Syrians to some degree. But the big fight that ended the relationship was that the Samaritans had their sanctuary on Mount Gerizim, which was north of Jerusalem. The Jews said, no, there's only one sanctuary and it's in Jerusalem and you have to come here. And the Samaritans said, no, we have our own sanctuary. Thank you. And Jews, said, that's not legitimate. That's not Judaism. And the Samaritan says, yes, it is. And the, and the Judeans said, no, it's not. And we're cutting you off. And that was how you ended up with two groups. Uh, well, this is, in essence, the two groups of priests lobbying for ascendancy and power. Right. Forgive me for saying this, but when I was in, in Israel in the old city in 2008, and we were going along the main drag, there were restaurants there, and they said that there was the remains of a priest's house that was built that was underneath one of the the shops that was there and we went down and the it was a beautiful it was really a beautiful relic because it was large they had running water uh they had bathtubs they had large rooms and are you thinking to yourself the priests lived very very well at that time and so naturally they would want all of the tribute sent to where into Jerusalem rather than dispersed elsewhere. So to me, it is essentially politics in a different form. That was the house of great, 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 great grandfather Kaplan. <laughs> and, and, and you saw, <laughs> you saw how well he did as a coin. My father couldn't earn a living as a coin. He had to become a dentist. Uh, which pays very poorly compared to how the coin them used to make as and so um it was kind of sad but my father always said you know i'm a coin and maybe someday i'll get appropriate job placement but meanwhile <laughs> i gotta earn a living so yes yeah, so um uh, and so the coin of the samaritans and the coin of the judeans could not agree on uh who had primacy but getting back to Evelyn's original question is when the temple was still standing in the sanctuary in Jerusalem, there were there is archaeological evidence of synagogues. Now, there's some archaeologists who specialize this. Uh, Jody Magnus, the University of North Carolina, for example, and she digs and digs and digs and finds synagogues and other stuff. And she writes about it. And. Um, and, and they, they can tell which towns were Canaanite and which towns were Israelite because, among other reasons, they find very few pig bones in the Israelite uh, towns. 
and you know and they do a lot with garbage you know they found garbage pits in towns and they go you know 2000 years later they excavate them and they they find what were these you know it's like what you were asking earlier about how often do people did people bathe in those times so you know this is the kind of question if you can if you can resurrect forgive the um the 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 word um information about how people lived and what they did you can learn a lot about the religious life as well so they they definitely had synagogues before the destruction of the second temple um but they think they were used a little bit more like jewish community centers places to play mahjong to have board meetings <laughs> to you know, to, uh, to do stuff like that um it's not clear that they did a lot of prayer maybe they did some studying there but it's like torah study they 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 didn't use zoom that much then but um it's not clear that they did you know services on friday and saturday the way we do now um once the temple was destroyed there was obviously the rabbis very quickly tried to figure out a new system and that new system involved prayer in synagogues. But as Evelyn pointed out, before they had synagogues, a lot of people must have prayed in little groups in their living rooms. So they heard from the rabbis, you should pray three times a day. Men should pray in groups of 10 or more. So they didn't have a synagogue. You can't run out and build one overnight. You have to take three bids and you have to go down to the tile store and pick out the tiles. So it could take months or, or years. You have to have a building committee. So they must have done as exactly as you say, Evelyn. They must have said, well, you know, Joe has, or Yassi has a big living room. Um, you know, we will gather there on Friday night at six o'clock. And they didn't have prayer books. They were just developing the prayers. And in the Talmud, there are transcripts of discussions. Well, how are we going to make the prayers? And they say, well, we have from the Torah this. Let's use that. And then, well, for the tefillah, which was the, the big prayer, on Friday nights, we only have like five or six or seven blessings left. We move over a little bit more. But and out loud, we only do like two. Um, but they, they had 18 blessings, which were the Shmona Esrei, means 18, and then later it was actually 19. So there are a lot of them. There was one about rebuilding temp the temple in Jerusalem. There was one about bringing peace. There was one about asking God to hear our voice. There was one for may we have health. And there was one that we don't have in our prayer book, which was attacking the heretics. And so in the Talmud, it says, who's going to write this? We need a, 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 it's not really a blessing. It's more like a curse against the heretics. So Shmuel HaKatan, meaning short Shmuel, I'm not making this up, raised <laughs> his hand, he says, I'll write it. And they said, short Shmuel is good at writing this stuff. Give him a week. I mean, they didn't say, they didn't give him a deadline like that, but they said, okay, short Shmuel, you write it. And he wrote it. Now, what is who was this intended to curse? We don't know. Could it have been against the early Jewish Christians? Maybe. Could it have been against other groups or more general? We don't know. But clearly the rabbis wanted to keep people in the temple to certain unified religious beliefs. Maybe we need to write one of those. <laughs> <laughs> more people back. <laughs> um, B. Now, there's something that's bothering me, and I don't know whether it's, <clears throat> whether it's right or wrong. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do the ultra-Orthodox, they study Torah, do they argue over certain passages, whether it's correct or not, and put in their comments? Ask the question again. When the ultra Orthodox study Torah, do they ever argue about phrases and comment on it if they don't believe it? They believe it. Um, 
is that connected to the question of the sanctuary or you're just asking something different? Something different because it's just been bothering me for about 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I mean, the ultra orthodox or the, the, the orthodox would, they take the, the, the sentences in the Torah and their assumption is that every sentence in the Torah is from God. Therefore, if there's any conflict, conflict between them, there must be a purpose to that conflict. God is trying to teach us something. So whereas a modern scholar would say there's a conflict between these sources, probably because they were put in by different groups. <clears throat> the ultra-Orthodox wouldn't say that, say, no, God is trying to teach us something. What, why would there be conflict or why is there repetition? And the reason is, and they would come up with a homiletical uh, excuse, that God is trying to teach us by saying the same thing three times, that you should bless it three times or something like that. Okay, but a modern they, scholar they, they, would not uh, would see that 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 is as an excuse, and they would say that the real reason is because there's different sources and it was written by different groups for different purposes. So, thank you. yeah, does that explain? Yeah. Okay, let's start reading uh, page sixty-three, Parakal of the Sanctuary and Jewish Tradition, Minya. Sanct <clears throat> excuse me, the sanctuary in Jewish tradition. Before the creation of the first Mikdash or sanctuary, the Hebrews worshiped God on hilltops, beside streams, or wherever they felt moved to pray. Abraham and Isaac traveled to Mount Moriah. Jacob encountered God in a lonely place on the desert and near the river Jabbok. Moses met God through an ordinary bush and at the top of Mount Sinai. Now, after their liberation from Egypt and the acceptance of the laws given to them at Mount Sinai, the people are commanded to build a sanctuary. The sanctuary is to contain the Ark of the Covenant with its state, sacred stones on which the 10 commandments are inscribed. It is to be placed in the Holy of Holies chamber inside the inner tabernacle. The opening of the Holy of Holies chamber is to be covered by a curtain. Outside the curtain is a special altar for incense, a table for <laughs> bread, and the golden menorah or lampstand. In front of the inner tabernacle is another curtain, outside of which are the laver and an altar for burnt offerings. Clearly, the sanctuary is designed for offering sacrifices and prayers to God. Some scholars believe that the inscription of the Mikdash did not belong to the original Torah, but was added to the story of Exodus by later priests who wanted to justify the existence of the temple and priesthood in Jerusalem. To prove their point, these critics argue that many of the materials mentioned in the Torah's description of the Mikdash were not available to the ancient Israelites in the Sinai desert. Uh -huh. So the, as you, you can see, if you look in the actual Torah, beginning on chapter 26, there's very extensive description of how you build the sanctuary, all the, the skins and the, the, the stones and the, the materials are quite expensive and elaborate. And meanwhile, we're talking about a group that's wandering through the desert. So there's an obvious uh, uh, there's an obvious problem with that, according to some people. Other people disagree, Minya. Other scholars disagree, maintaining that the Mikdash was one of the earliest of all Jewish institutions, though later authors of the Torah may have exaggerated about how it was built and the materials used in its construction. H.M. Orlinsky explains, acacia wood, cedar, cypress, or olive was later used in Canaan. Ram skins, lamb skins, cloths of goat's hair, and the like are all manifestations of nomadic existence. Aha. Uh -huh. So this is very interesting. And H.M. Orlinsky, my father for many years had his big book on the Bible, Harry Orlinsky. He was a professor at Hebrew Union College in New York uh, long before my time. 
and um, he was he played, by the way, a key role in Israel acquiring the original Dead Sea Scrolls. Right, there were originally seven, and I think um, uh, Professor Eliezer Sulanik acquired a few of them, and then the the the, the original um, dealer, a guy named Kondo who was uh, originally a shoemaker. And because he was a shoemaker, he dealt with leather. The um, Bedouins who found the scrolls, you know, leather scrolls, brought him the scrolls because he was the expert in leather. And he bought them for a few dollars. And he, and, and, and he eventually sold a few of the big scrolls to this Greek Orthodox uh, bishop who then emigrated to the US. And he wanted to sell them to make money to reestablish himself in the US, but he'd promised not to sell them to the Jews so or to the Israelis. So Harry Orlinsky pretended to be an interested American buyer. And he went to see this uh, priest and, uh, but he's really secretly was an expert in this and he was represent. He was doing this as a favor to the Israelis. So um, he looked at the scrolls and he realized they were authentic. And he pretended he was just some rich collector from New York or wherever. And he bought them for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And then he turned. And that money came from the Israeli government. And that those are part, some of the scrolls that are in the shrine of the book in Jerusalem. So that's Orlinsky. And Orlinsky argues here that, that these materials, even though they sound pretty fancy, they are things that you would find in the desert. And um, so maybe, you know, it's, it's very hard to say, you know, was this added later? Was it, were the later authors trying to make it look authentic? Was it actually early? You know, it, it's it's something you could read about in great, great, great depth. Marsha. So going back, they're wandering across the desert. They're carrying the ark, you know, and they, when they stop, they do have a Ursat's sanctuary that they have and they stop, right? So it's sort of right. like a big tent that does serves this purpose with, over this layout. And they may pick it up on sticks so they can carry it. Right, so I'm just going over reviewing <laughs> the right. situation here. So this is how, how they had a sanctuary as they crossed the desert. Okay. Right. Right. So and according now, to the Torah's account, yes, and right. we call that a tabernacle rather than a temple. Okay. So in a in previous sanctuaries, the lay people were not allowed in. It was just for the priests. <laughs> and whatever um yes and in the temple in jerusalem they were allowed in but only at the outside part okay so it was basically the same idea the inner part is only for the koanim and the the holy of holies is only for the high priest and only on the day of yom kippur okay and this is a ritual not a ceremony my differentiation between this is that a ritual is something that has to be done in a particular manner to be efficacious. Uh, a ceremony is something like we do in our temple, that the purpose is to meet the needs, spiritual needs of the worshipers. So if I say, well, let's do it all in Hebrew, I like Hebrew, and Evelyn says, but I don't understand Hebrew, then we'll do more English because the goal is for her to understand and to get meaning and spiritual sustenance from it. But a, 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 a ritual has to be done the way God tells you to do it. Doesn't matter if Evelyn understands. Doesn't matter if I like it. It's done the way that God says it, no other way. And if you do deviate, God may kill you or something, or certainly it won't work. The purpose is to communicate with God so that God will respond positively. So a ritual is much stricter 
than a ceremony. The purpose is, this is my definitions of ritual and ceremony. It's, I'm just making this up. But it, I think the, the point is that there's two very different approaches. And, and here they're not, they're not trying to please the congregants. So there's no reason to have them around. The goal is for the conium to do the ritual the way God has ordered it to be done. Does that answer your question? You have to unmute, you have to unmute. I lost my mind. Um, so how many Kohanim are there present, were there present? Did it, was that specified? Were they there to monitor one another to make sure it was done properly? Who's to say? <laughs> um, there was a good group. I mean, the Kohanim come out of the tribe of Levi um, and you know, they're descendants of Aaron. Um, but there was quite a few. And then the Levites are there to help the Kohanim. So and where did the Minion come from? Was there, was there a Minion of Kohanim? Uh, and uh, no, Minion is, uh, Minion is different. Minion is completely separate. Okay. Uh, so Minion is, is later the rabbis, you know, were trying to come up with the prayer idea. And they said, well, we don't want people praying privately. We want them praying in groups. So what constitutes a group? And if you if you need to have a group in order to say certain prayers out loud. So then they said, well, Abraham, when he negotiated with God for Sodom and Gomorrah, he yeah. said, if I can find 10 righteous people, then that was the bottom line. So the rabbis liked that and they thought it was a good number. And so they said, obviously Abraham thought the 10 is a group. And so that's what we're gonna go with. Okay. But that doesn't really have anything to do with the Kohanim as far as I'm aware. In the Kohanim, they functioned however many you needed to do the ritual. It might be one, it might be two, it might be four, it might be, I don't know. But I don't think you needed 10. And the Levies helped, I, you know, how much information we know about, you know, exactly what's done in the temple. This is stuff I don't, um, um, in Georgia, somebody gave me a complete collection of Jacob Milgram's books on the book of Leviticus. Dr. Stuart Goldsmith, who's uh, president of the Georgia Temple now. And he came once, I think, to Torah study um, about two or three years ago. And uh, so uh, I have those books in Jamaica. <laughs> so <laughs> if I get them over here and then if I read them, but, you know, reading about Leviticus is very boring. I mean, it's all this, you know, very detailed stuff about who did what ritual in the temple and how the animal was sacrificed and where the blood was put and what knife was used and what, you know, you know, it, you really have to have some reason to want to study that amount of detail. And it's rather uh, horrific as well. <laughs> Other comments, questions, responses to what has been read? If not, let's go back to Minya. Why would we never be able to prove when the Mikdash or the first Jewish sanctuary came into existence? The Torah does seek to clarify its purpose. Moses is instructed by God to tell the people and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. What do these words really mean? Is it possible God was telling the people that without a sanctuary, a building, a place for the Ark of the Covenant, or altars for sacrifice, they would not sense the presence of God in their lives? Are sanctuaries necessary for worship, for finding God? Does God require a building in order to dwell among human beings? We're going to skip the box and go continue on the next page, but... You know, th this quote could be interpreted in different ways, you know, but I think that in Reform Judaism, we would say that, um, uh, that no, you could pray in your backyard, you can pray uh, in your house, you can pray in the forest, you can pray in the mountains, you can pray in while you're swimming, you, you can pray anywhere that you find uh, a sense of spirituality. So... So, so we have an answer to that, 
But then on the other hand, we want to have a reason why a synagogue is special, because if you can pray anywhere, then what do you need a synagogue for? Okay, keep going, Minya, Jewish tradition. Jewish tradition teaches that we experience God in many ways. God is to be found in the beauty and mystery of nature, in the love and friendship we share with others, in the spiritual impact of a ritual or a celebration, and in the work done to promote justice, generosity, and peace. There is no exclusive place for God. There are many places where God dwells. King Solomon, who built the first temple in Jerusalem, admitted that God, who could not be contained by all the heavens, could certainly not be limited to this house that I have built. Okay, comments. Um, Pam. God is also in the biblical garden. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just saying. Could you elaborate on that? <laughs> well, I, that's what we're trying to do by having all those signs in the garden with various biblical uh, things. And hopefully that it creates a feeling of this is a place that uh, of God. So wouldn't this be just two aspect, two different aspects of worshiping God that Part of it is that which we feel God's presence within ourselves. But the purpose of the sanctuary is for community and to perpetuate the Jewish community by having people worship together. You create a cohesive group which will stay together because they have worshiped together. They have shared these experiences together. So I don't think one is mutually exclusive of the other. I think it's all part of the overall picture, the sense of the feeling of religiousness in the temple itself or the, the, the synagogue, as the case may be. But also, you can have a sense of community with God. You go out and walk and hike in the mountains, and you can't help but being overcome by the beauty and the wonder that some entity created this beautiful world. And so, yes, you have this personal sense of God, but also it is necessary for you to feel part of this group. And the one way of doing it is to gather together in a mutual gathering place, which we call the sanctuary as such. Am I? That's you know, beautiful. That's I agree, beautiful. I agree with that. I agree with get that. We should get Evelyn on video and put it on our new website. Oh, yeah. short <laughs> I'm not sure I'd like that. Um, B, B, B. Well, B. I agree with everything Evelyn said, but there is one difference between the feeling, because I have prayed when I swim and, uh, and prayed in different places, but being in temple, you with the Torah, God's word, and it feels, and I think praying together as a group feels stronger than praying alone. That's what I, I said. Um, you're I not disagreeing that. with me at all. You know, no, you need not. both. You need both. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yes, because we need people. That's right. It was a song a long time ago about mm -hmm. needing people, and everybody needs people. And, but they also need to have a private um, area with, with where we just communicate with God, uh, just a one-to-one -one basis. So you're right, Evelyn, is both are necessary. Yeah, well, again, it's all part of the one picture. Different aspects of the same thing. <laughs> Different parts of the pie. <laughs> and in recent years, there's much less stress on the interconnectedness between people the trends of working from home, where you sit at home all day, every day, just using your computer. And, um, you know, these are people in the prime of their work lives and they don't actually encounter anyone. Yeah. And it's just, uh, 
It, I think so, it's destructive. Uh, it's destructive to the sense of community as such. So. so so, what Donna and Evelyn said would seem to be uh, self-explanatory, but it actually is kind of countercultural today. Bernie? Um, I heard you're trying to build a sanctuary. I heard you're trying to build a sanctuary down there in Denver. And the rabbis would like to communicate to you that this is strictly prohibited. The only sanctuary can be built in Jerusalem. I've only got four Jews in my building, so we wouldn't even be able to get a minion. <laughs> there, there are situations, certainly, where people can't leave their home, both physically or whatever. And, uh, and then what we have now we have computers and we have television sets where there are different services uh, can be viewed on either one of them. One of them. And I'm sorry. And where, um, <laughs> where they're not actually in the physical um, being with the people, at least they see them and they can uh, uh, be with them, so to speak on the uh, um on the computer or the television set. <clears throat> I'm not with any of you today, but I feel a part of this group, and uh, which is kind of the same thing, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, other comments, Riva, Lorraine. Yeah, I, I yes, I'm, en I'm enjoying this section. I think it's very interesting to have this discussion of how do we perceive of God and what is the role of a sanctuary? And I think those are two interesting issues to address. And, uh, and we obviously haven't come to any conclusions. I will point out that our synagogue has what we call a sanctuary, but that sanctuary is very different from the sanctuary we're talking about this morning. That's why I asked you about yeah, that's why I was asking you about the different uses, et cetera, previous. The rabbis tried to bring over some of the symbolism from the original sanctuary to our current sanctuary, but a lot of things they could or didn't want to. Um, okay, Minya, back to you. That is so. If no migdash or sanctuary can be the exclusive place of God, then what can the Torah mean when it reports that God said to Moses, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them? What is the purpose or the function of the sanctuary in Jewish tradition? I think Evelyn just explained it to us very well. The early rabbis offer an answer through an imaginary conversation between God and the people of Israel. They picture the people explaining to God that all human Rulers have beautiful palaces, rooms where offerings are brought to them and where the people can demonstrate their loyalty and love. The people say to God, shouldn't you, our ruler, have such a palace? And according to the rabbis, God responds, my children, I have no need for such a place. After all, I do not eat or drink. Obviously, however, you have a need for such a place. It will help you experience me. <clears throat> For that reason, build a sanctuary and I will dwell in your midst. Okay. Hmm. Comments, responses to this last paragraph. And yet there's a barbecue in there all the time and yeah. the offerings. I mean, I, I, I still, I mean, is that just to show that you're offering something to God as opposed, it has no real meaning other than that. Well, in the book I'm reading now, what uh, Michael Barwitz and I are reading, The God and Anatomy by the British woman scholar, she argues that in the Bible, God is very much embodied. God eats and drinks and has sex and smells nice odors. And that would be very consistent with the sacrifices. God wants to smell the nice odors of the sacrifices. And so God has a nose and God smells. And that's oh. what God wants. Oh, now, later. 
God, may I interrupt just a second? You yeah. are essentially saying that this woman believes that God is an anthropomorphic individual and that that he in is... The Bible, in the Bible, as described in the Bible, not that she believes it personally, that that's how the Bible describes is it. Is written. Yeah. yeah. She says that throughout the five books of Moses, that is the way that God is seen, not... Now, later, much later, like Maimonides in the 12th century, only 800 years ago, he spent his entire Guide to the Perplexed practically showing, uh, trying to, to, to disabuse us of this. And it says, when God reaches out, this is just um, Torah using the language of people. That doesn't mean God has an arm reaching out. It just is a way of talking so we would understand. And Maimonides goes through time and time again, all of these examples where God smells and God reaches and God touches and so forth and says, no, this is all meant symbolically. But obviously Maimonides felt this was a very sensitive point because he spent so much time trying to prove it wasn't true. And this woman, she says, if you look at the Bible, it's very clear that the entirety of the Bible it, he understands God to to be like a, a Greek God, you know, somebody who had a body and used the body from the feet, toes of the feet, all the way to the hair in his head. Ah, uh, but what about the human personality traits that God is trying to get have us uh, get rid of? In other words, greed and lust, avarice, the the tendency to war. If God is like this, then God is no better than what we consider humans to be. Well, I, I'm just, I'm, don't shoot the messenger, Evelyn, the messenger. please. <laughs> I'm just telling you what she wrote. You can read her book, God and Anatomy, and you can complain to her. A lot of people, she apparently she's received death threats, which is pretty good if you're writing about religion. I've written several books and I have not received not a single death threat. <laughs> uh, Be grateful. Few, you like us to or, or organize some? A few months ago, I got a long letter from a Hasidic guy in Canada attacking my views in one of my books, which he pointed out he would not buy because it wouldn't be allowed, according to Jewish law, to buy such a horrible book. But he found it in the library, and he couldn't believe what I said and. And, but he doesn't seem to have emails. So I would write, I mean, I'm complimented that he spent so much time critiquing my, <laughs> my, my, my book. Um, I guess I could send, you know, I have his address. I could send him a letter the old fashioned way, but that seems rather primitive. But, um, but, um, but she says, yes, that God has personality and much of that personality is rather quick to anger, right? That God gets angry and does things like kill people very quickly, you know? And, you know, what does Moses do that keeps him out of the Holy Land? He doesn't follow instructions. He's in the desert. He's in a stressful situation. He hasn't showered for three days. He didn't have coffee that morning. So God says, talk to the rock and he hits the rock. And for that, God says, you're not going anywhere. This is it. I mean, you're going to die right here. And in other cases, God is just kills people. So she argues that, yes, God has a personality like a person, and that personality is rather uh, quick to anger. And, and, and then over the course of the Bible, God mellows a little bit. But now I'm not saying I agree with her, and I'm not saying that I advocate for her far from it, but I'm just pointing out that, that she's presenting that what, what's in the Bible is completely opposite to what we have been told about Judaism and what Maimonides and many other th later thinkers argued about Judaism. So what's the truth? That's one of the reasons we're trying to look at the Torah itself so that we can see what's in the Torah. Now, what's in the Torah and what's Judaism are two very different things as we know, but it's the basis, so we have to come to accounts of what's in the Torah, and then we have to decide what we want to do with it. And, and do we want to follow the rabbis of the sages or in the Talmud, or do we want to go in a different direction? 
And, uh, you know, what legitimacy is there? What gives us the right to go in any different direction? Uh, Riva, um, yeah, Riva and then Minya. I think the title of this parak, the sanctuary in Jewish tradition is wonderful because, you know, we can look at the evolution of what, how we see sanctuary over time. And we can also think about it, how we perceive of sanctuary now in the modern world. And, you know, we, many of us have been certainly, certainly between us to many, many different temples. And some of them are extraordinarily elaborate and, you know, and look like a huge amount of money went into them. Some of them are very, very modest, you know, in their appearance and there's a whole range in between. And also along with that, how do we use that sanctuary space? You know, how has it been used in history and how do we use it nowadays? And that word sanctuary is a very powerful word in itself. You know, it, it um, is a, a place for, for dwelling on God or being with God or being with our religious communities. It's also, sanctuaries have also been used as a safe space yeah. over a great deal of time. Um, I, when I was putting my house together, I always thought I want my home to be a sanctuary. I wanted to be a place where people are comfortable and feel welcomed and feel, feel you know, okay, very comfortable and safe, especially. And so I think, you know, this enormous role for the, for the temple in that way too, there's been a lot of work for taking care of the poor, you know, through sanctuaries. Um, and I know we're going to visit the, um, one, one of the food banks in, in a couple of days as, as part of our community. And I think that's a terrific activity to do as, as a part of our sanctuary, as part of our community. Okay, thank you, Riva. Minya, I think you were next. I just, I just wanted to go back to the woman who wrote the book you were telling us about. Does she start out by saying that because man was made in God's image, I feel that God has the same kind of characteristics and personality that people have. And that's why she attributed all of these things to God, because that's how humans are. So is that how she starts her book? Uh, that is one of her points, but only one of many, many, many points. Okay. Um, but yes, yeah, she says that, that that is consistent as well with, uh, um, with this view that when it says, you know, God says, let us make God, uh, let's us make people in the image of God. It means it literally that, you know, God is planning to make people to look like God. Uh, the way that we understand it in post-biblical Judaism is that it is symbolic, that we are in the image of God in the sense of that there's something divine, holy, positive in our souls that is like God. Not that our hair is like God uh, or, or that we're nearsighted like God or that we have legs like God, but that there's something symbolic in terms of values, in terms of, of some spiritual essence. But she says that's not the original intent. That's not what the biblical authors had in mind at all. And so, you know, you, you, know, you could judge whether you, what, to what extent her argument is, uh, um, is convincing. What you just said could be related to the spirit of God that each one of us has the spirit of God within us. And that's how right. we can communicate with God is because he gave us part of his spirit. And that, that part of the soul goes back mm -hmm. to God after death and then is reunited with God. And then is, you know, so that is, that is the belief in mysticism. That is the belief in rabbinic theology, I believe. And that is the belief that many Jews hold today. But is that the original belief from the biblical times? That's, that's a different question. Uh, Evelyn, Pam, Steve. Yeah, I've got a comment. Uh, curiously, I've, you know, I've been to a number of different synagogues and different sanctuaries, and they all have something very much in common. Symbol, the symbols within the sanctuary themselves um, I'm just curious, though, Rabbi, is there a uh, an architect's ruling 
as to how sanctuary should be constructed in modern times? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. I, I actually just published an article in the Australian Journal of Jewish Studies about American synagogue architecture post-World War II. And so the question is, you know, how to, you know, what is the guidance from tradition about building a synagogue building and particularly the sanctuary? sanctuary yes. And um, and how do you make it, you know, uh, distinctive from Christian houses of worship um, and uh, distinctly Jewish in a in a in a re religious way? And and so that was the, that's what the a challenge that different generations had to had to face. So the the sages of the Talmud had certain instructions. You know there should be an ark, and you should put the Torahs in the ark, and there should be a ner tamid. There should be an eternal light, and there are reasons given for that. And there should not be anywhere to sacrifice animals because we don't sacrifice animals to God without the temple in Jerusalem. See, if they would have decided, we're going to, now that the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed, we're going to allow everyone to make their own little temple and, and sacrifice animals, not cats and not dogs. So don't <laughs> worry. But um, uh, that would have made it a lot easier in some ways, right? Then everybody could have a real temple and we could, we'd have, you know, the, the loss of the Jerusalem temple wouldn't have been a problem because we could build uh, 50 or 100 temples just like McDonald's. Mm -hmm. But they said, no, with the only place you can have a temple is in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount and, and nowhere else. So then no, no sacrifices. So what do you do instead? And the rabbis, you know, they walked around and they saw the destroyed temple and they started, one rabbi started crying. And the other rabbi said, don't worry. Uh, instead of sacrifices, we have prayer and good deeds. Bernie. On, this, on that same subject, um, how long has it been since, or, or how long have we faced East, or faced Jerusalem, rather, when we pray? That also came from the, from the early sages. After destruction of the temple, they said, let's build synagogues. And then they started saying, you know, let's have a near tamid, which symbolizes the, the the fire that was always burning in the temple, right? The near tamid comes directly from the temple. Um, and let's face toward the temple. It's not facing to Jerusalem just to, because Jerusalem has good restaurants. It's facing Jerusalem because the, the, the Jerusalem temple was there. So that was part of it. You're praying towards Jerusalem. And one of the interesting things, I was just listening to some YouTube videos in Hebrew yesterday about Purim. And uh, th there's this Russian guy who moved to Israel. And he he must not have a job because he, he interviews everybody in Israel on all Judaic matters. It's very nice. His Hebrew is good, but it's hard to hear, listen to him because of the Russian accent is is very great. <laughs> he interviews all the and it's called Boim uh, Ella Professorim, going to the professors. So he goes to talk, interview all these professors. So I guess because it's almost Purim, he he had at least two videos up interviewing different uh, professors about the the Scroll of Esther and Purim, and one of them was saying that not only is there no mention of God in the, in the scroll of Esther, there's no reference to Jerusalem or Zion. The, the, or bo both of the interviews uh, said this in different ways, that not, the Jews of Persia want to survive. They don't want Haman to kill them, but they don't want to leave Persia. They're not trying to make another exodus from Egypt. Their plan is to kill Haman who wanted to kill them and go back to being good Persians, right? There's not a single reference to prayer in the whole thing. Esther fasts or she tells, she fasts for three days and she tells Mor Mordechai, her uncle, to fast, but there's no prayers associated with the fasting. She doesn't say go to your synagogues and pray and fast. 
She just says fast. And she doesn't say, when this is over, if we're all alive, we're going to leave this country and go to Israel. She doesn't say anything like that. Mm-hmm. And, and then when they do survive, the Jews celebrate, and they celebrate how it's wonderful to live in Persia now that Haman is gone. So it's a very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting tape that not, but, but in the rabbi's theology, the rabbis were, we're facing Jerusalem. Our goal is to rebuild the temple, to restore animal sacrifice, to live in Israel where we can do our pilgrimages uh, three times a year at least to Jerusalem for Sukkot, Pesach, and Shavuot. Not to live far out there in Persia, wherever, speaking Persian and not praying. Yeah. So mm-hmm. Esther, Esther was not a good Jew, according to the rabbis. You know, I'm, I'm, exa- I'm kind of, you know, uh, saying this uh, to, to be provocative a little bit. She married a non-Jew. She didn't pray. She didn't keep kosher. She didn't. She wasn't a Zionist. <laughs> there was no Zionism. <laughs> but but there were Zionists. What Daniel and some of these, when they went to exile in Babylonia, right? Who wrote that psalm? We sat by the rivers in Babylon and we cried. When are we going to go back to Jerusalem? But Esther doesn't do that. Mordechai, Mordechai is a big shot mm-hmm. in the court. You know, he doesn't want to go anywhere. He's got a great career in Persia. So these people are assimilated. Really yeah. assimilated. Yeah. Yeah. So why do we celebrate uh, Esther and Purim? We're assimilated. They're just like us. <laughs> just Well, and, and just like Haman threatened to kill them all, in the not so distant past, the Nazis threatened to kill us all. So it's a holiday that it doesn't, even though the story may not be true, the, the theme is very, 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 it couldn't be more relevant, right? It, 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 it couldn't have been more relevant to American Jews if it had been written by an American Jew. And I, but, I know uh, Bernie that. And, Bernie and then Marsha. Okay. A couple of things. One, Mordecai wasn't such a good Jew either. He pimped out his niece to the king. <laughs> Second, um, Purim is one of these holidays that they tried to kill us. They failed. Now let's eat. And speaking of eating, has anybody tried to buy poppy seeds in the surprise Sun City area? No, you have to mail order it. You order it from Penzi's. Penzi's Spices. Uh, oh, I, I got them from Amazon, but uh, all right, that's another I, place. But my son couldn't find it, the solo brand in New Jersey, and I couldn't oh, find the you can contact you can you can contact solo.com and they will ship you six minimum and they're good oh, for two years. Yes, I got two from Amazon last year. You had to buy six, yeah. Oh. Um, but, uh, but uh, the oh. solo people, it's cheaper to get them online from solo. Than it is but to Bernie, order. if you apply for a job after eating hamantash with poppy seeds, you can test positive for drugs. Drugs, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So I don't want your career like being uh, curtailed because of this. I'll take the risk. <laughs> um, Riva. Yeah, among others here, Purim never made much sense to me. But what you said in the gratitude class yesterday really was meaningful and I thought it was wonderful. And you said one of the reasons around wearing a mask was it provided people with the opportunity to um, to give to other poor people without being identified as the source of the gift. And, and that whole business of um, the highest level of giving is yeah. that both the giver and the receiver don't know one another or don't identify one another. And I thought that was a wonderful aspect of the holiday, which I had never heard of before. Can I mention something? Um, uh, thank you, Riva. And that that the whole essay is published on jewishphoenix.com yesterday as well. Uh, Marsha. This is a terrible thing to have to mention, but uh, Cheryl Millman, Harvey's daughter, had uh, 
texted uh, a few of us yesterday on Friday in Chicago, there is a day of hate. Again, it's an anti-Semitic uh, uh, protest of some hate. sort that's going to be celebrated. And it, you know, it's just so disturbing to hear about that. I, um, I think we checked with Jewish news uh, locally and there's nothing on there. And uh, maybe it's being kept under wraps so it doesn't become a big public thing, you know, that it winds up being spread from city to city, but uh, it's that's pretty a pretty terrible thing, you know. We it sort of relates to Purim and Haman and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so just be aware. Okay. Okay. Um, and just in time for Purim. Just in time for Purim, right? So Purim has the positive and the negative. We won. Let's eat, as Bernie says. It's very joyous. <laughs> But we wouldn't have holidays like that if we didn't have problems. All right. uh, any final comments? If not, I'll turn it back over to Steve. And uh, this was a very interesting uh, uh, session today. I'm relying upon you not to tell any of my secret esoteric beliefs. Uh, Maimonides is going to be mad at me. The, the Central Conference of American Rabbis will be mad at me. The Orthodox rabbi in, in both Glendale and Goodyear would be mad at me. I have enough enemies that I don't want to make any more. So, so <laughs> mum is the word. Steve, okay. over to you. All right. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to mention. Uh, first of all, at 1230 tomorrow, <clears throat> this was mentioned earlier, uh, we are going to tour the uh, Valley View uh, Food Bank. Uh, it's on 107th and Peoria at 12:30, and if you're interested in going, I think the number is limited to about 10, 10 individuals. We could maybe expand it depending on on uh, the 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 group. But anyway, just wanted to mention that. Also, uh, March 3rd at Shabbat services, uh, we are going to honor our Kabod Award winners. And Pam Katz is one of them, and Bonnie Lawmeyer is the other. And there's a potluck uh, dinner before at 5.15, then following the service. Um, and then there's a nice Onig uh, sponsored by the Brotherhood. On Sunday, the 5th, uh, we have a speaker at the temple, and before that is a pancake and bagel breakfast. It's uh, at 10 o'clock and then following the, with the speaker. That's all I have besides the blessing. Okay. Two quickies. Go ahead, Reva. Uh, first of all, a um, number of people at the very, when we just started today, mentioned that they didn't have the, um, the schedule of Torah readings going forward after February. Um, that you should be receiving within a couple of days Along with that, we'll be sending you a timeline of the first temple, temple second temple edition landmarks in, in Jewish history. So keep an eye out for those two things. And when you get them, print them and keep them okay. because you're going to need them. Right, right. Let us conclude with the blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Amen. Uh, have a great rest of the week, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank Lorraine. You. Okay. Lorraine, <laughs> Marcia, I, I sent oh, you an email with the information that we talked about earlier. About okay. Thank you. Yeah.